excited to introduce our, our panel. Uh, I'll, I'll ask them to, to join on stage. Um, uh, Ken Mortson, who is the General Manager of Supply Chain Services at Agilence and has had a, a, a career uh, in, in numerous roles, including a lot of time in logistics engineering, so a really well-placed to talk not just about what Agilence can do, but also best practice in the industry. Ken, why don't you join us on stage? <laughs> Ken, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, also very pleased that we can welcome Steve Brown, who is Vice President of Part Supply Chain of Toyota North America, uh, overseeing various aspects of supply chain logistics for Toyota's plants in the US and Mexico, and, uh, and, and wealth of experience there. So Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, welcome. As mentioned, the tier one space, also critical, also has its own complexities as well when it comes to managing a mix of, of, of uh, own, own source and, and OEM directed source. And so really pleased that Maxim Serov, who, direct, who is the director of supply chain management across North America for Benteler and his career there. So thank you so much for joining us, Maxim. Last but certainly not least, Richard DeBoer is Executive Vice President, Supply Chain Logistics at Carter Logistics and is a strategic logistics provider in 3PL for a number of OEMs in the region and certainly has a lot of great experience to share with us on a topic today. Richard. Thanks very much. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna keep it as an open discussion um, for the next 45 minutes or so. And um, you know, we'll, we'll open as much as we can to the floor too, so please don't be shy. But I, I wanna just uh, kick off by getting each of the panelists' views uh, on, on early logistics planning. Uh, is the, and, and particularly in the context of what's happening today. So the question in the current level of supply chain disruption in recent years, is it forcing a rethink uh, in how in the ways that you design and coordinate logistics from the start of, of model programs and planning? And I'd like to start with Steve uh, from Toyota on that. Uh, thanks, Chris. Hey, hello, everybody. Uh, glad to be back in person. I think last, week, last year I did a virtual yeah. uh, type of this. It's really good to see everybody, and thanks for all you do for logistics. The, uh, the early logistics planning at Toyota is definitely changing based on what's happened in the last couple of years. The, the, the basic structure that we use is always the same. We have kind of what we call the four laws of logistics. One is, you know, high frequency cyclic planning, which is a very important part of the way we do things. And then lead time, always trying to shorten lead time. And then efficiency comes into play. But then finally, we have to be flexible. So the, the meaning of flexible has completely changed, right, with this last couple of years. It used to be when we did long range planning for cost, it was really about how can we be aggressive to, to reduce cost? And, and we used a very conservative approach to that. But now we, we really have to think about how do we build that flexibility into the things we don't know based on the last few years. So it's very important. Yeah, oh, we're going to get into more of the detail on that indeed. But Maxim, uh, some initial thoughts from, from Bentler in terms of how the current situation has impacted or changed how you design your logistics early on. Yeah, so for Bentler, uh, the, this year was pretty tough, especially the beginning of the year, quarter one, quarter two. So basically what, uh, what's happened uh, overnight, the transit time for ocean become twice longer, especially from North, uh, north um, Europe to Mexico. So every third, fourth uh, vessel was omit, omitting the destination, uh, port congestion, etc. So it was really, really tough. So we, uh, it was tough. We were able to manage that. So we are running much more better right now. Are we resilient? I don't know. So we need to maybe to talk about what does it mean resilience. And yesterday I spoke with my colleague uh, Oleg uh, from Ford, and and we're discussing this topic. And I said, so for me, resiliency when you get the part and in the right time, uh, at the right cost, um, and the right quantity. So do we have it now? Probably not. So it means that something wrong and we have to collaborate, we have to, uh, we have to work together on, uh, on improvements. So and if I'm looking back, um, um, if I could do something different, yes, I think we could. We could react maybe faster. Mm -hmm. We could uh, probably uh, pick a different service for Ocean not uh, trying to save money on multi-stop uh, services and uh, having issues on every single port in the East Coast, for example, but maybe ship the parts directly from, uh, from Europe to Mexico. A little bit more expensive, but uh, definitely shorter. So, um, yeah, so the, I, I think there were opportunities which we need to consider. We have to learn from that, and this is what we are doing. We are learning, 
uh, we're using data for decision taking, so uh, we are implementing new tools. Um, and of course, to do that, to improve the current situation, so we need to collaborate. So obviously, for me, this is uh, pretty clear. So already driving changes, both in the, the potential trade-offs that you make between cost, lead time, performance, as well as how you partner with with providers and the tools that you use. So a, a good sum up of, of things we're already seeing and we will talk more about. Um, Richard, can you talk a little bit from Carter's point of view and logistics provider, how the current situation has, has or isn't uh, changing the way you work with, with OEMs to design your networks? Yeah, I, I guess to go back a couple years ago when uh, the plants were shut down, had a lot of customers that we had to park a lot of equipment, furlough the drivers. Um, it really put a more emphasis on our customers because what was happening is we had data, we worked through the data, we communicated, but a lot of our customers, um, they might have had seven of their 14 plants shut down, but the other seven were running, not all the lines, so we had to be on the phone with our customers continuously to understand what was going into their supply chain, what products, what suppliers were open, what suppliers were closed, what modifications they were doing. So I think our heightened focus on our customers really improved our organization mm -hmm. through, through that, and, and that has continued. Our CI team that we have that works with our customers are more involved today than probably what they were two to three years ago. So that, that's a real positive. As far as the drivers are concerned, <coughs> Uh, the two major elements of the drivers is one is we were recruiting a lot of drivers through schools and schools shut down. So we had to uh, refocus ourselves on traditional recruitment of drivers coming from other trucking companies rather than coming out of the schools. Um, so that has helped us because we're bringing, uh, we've kind of perfected that process where we had perfected the schools before um, so that has helped us to be more flexible. Uh, the other item is um, without the drivers being allowed on docks, uh, that has continued um, for the most part. Some people are letting our drivers on the docks, but you've got the big, you've got the securement issue where the drivers in the past were able to go on the docks, make sure that everything is secured totally properly. Well, a lot of times uh, some of the product is being sealed and they do not have a chance to look at the product to make sure that the securement is right. So it's really kind of the commercial aspect of it, making sure that we're protected if in fact, um, you know, product does roll because of not, that we can't view the product itself. So there's been some commercial changes also. Mm. Okay, so quite a, quite a dynamic situation. Ken, from, uh, from, your from both from your experience, but also what, what, what is happening with Agilence and how you're working with customers, what changes have you seen in this aspect? From a logistics planning perspective, we're seeing um, a lot more interest in tools. The tool that we have that supports more tactical and operational planning than strategic. I think part of that's because of the dramatic cost structure shifts that we've seen the last couple years. I mean, oceans in one direction, trucking's in another. That strategic design or model that worked two years ago, five years ago, it's not the same strategy you need anymore. And the strategic tools that are maybe a little bit more generic in cost structure um, aren't as helpful now, today, as what they used to be. So we, we see folks wanting that extra amount of detail and applying the tactical operational tools to a strategic answer because they, they want to make sure that, that that detail is considered. Yeah, absolutely. As you said, the, the, and as it was echoed across the panel, the inputs have changed so much in that, in that period. Okay, thanks for the initial impression. So I want to, I wanna, um, Steve, just go back to you uh, next just to get a little bit more sense of how some of that early logistics design and collaboration works at Toyota in terms of when you work with design, engineer, manufacturing, at what point does this logistics launch planning, well, uh, sorry, what phase in the launch do you start to model the logistics and, and, and say what are some of the key factors you're, you're really trying to influence there? Yeah, a good question. I think, you know, just from kind of starting point, uh, we are, we're really lucky in the way it works at Toyota because logistics is one of the pillars at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. 
has direct reporting up to the chief engineer for a new model, a new plant, that type of thing. So we're looking at cost right away. But at the beginning, we're looking at, at historic data because parts data, that type of stuff is not, a, is not available at that point. But as that information grows, uh, we continue to consider. So when, we, when, we, when we're in that, at, when we have a seat at the table like that, we're able to influence make versus buy because we all know that for logistics the best logistics is no logistics so we want to make it right we're like hey let's make everything right there so we don't have to have any logistics but that didn't, it doesn't work that way but when we see the opportunities to do that we'll, we'll push for that make decision and then as we go into the buy side you know we're, we're we're definitely looking at you know can we move a supplier closer can we do that type of thing can we localize and uh, we consider those those options and have a lot of influence because of that the structure that we have. The um, at the point of of when do we start to model? We we do model pretty early. I I, I guess I don't know the comparison, but uh, um, but probably you know about 18 months out we begin to model uh, structure and and, and uh, that type of thing for logistics route design. Any new f facilities or equipment is maybe a little earlier than that because you know we want to let everybody know what uh, what what's going to happen. So. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like the, 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 the structure and process was, is well established for logistics to have a strong voice, probably uh, valuable, valuably strong voice indeed. Just to, just to choose two very recent examples, because you, you, you've been, I'm sure your teams have been involved in the factories uh, in Mexico and, and the Mazda uh, joint venture in Alabama, which both sort of ramped up in, in, in the unique circumstances that we've been living through. So, you know, I guess the question is, uh, you know, did, was it different as a result, or, or did you really see in action your ability to, to influence and have that strong voice at the table, you know, really paying dividends there? Yeah, yeah it's, it's because of the timing of those, as you mentioned, really around the, when COVID started and, and through COVID, especially for the, um, the Mazda Toyota joint venture, that was right in the middle of that. So, you know, structurally, our our role there at for Toyota is we actually plan and operate all the external logistics for both Toyota and Mazda. So a little bit of a supply chain as a service concept, but uh, it's it's been it's been difficult because of what's been going on. But when we start a new plant, we always our first goal is to stabilize the plant. We try to not overwhelm the plant with volume, that type of thing. And and in this case, you know they're they're their output we try to keep as stable as possible so everything can begin to work together properly so that's one of the things we really try to do during during this period of course there's there's issues that can come up and that type of thing that we work through but uh, we had strong logistics partners there um, a lot of activity Carter's one of them thank you <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's been it's been uh, it's been good it's uh, been a good joint venture experience and just uh, it you know the supply base and the the LPs are faced with so many issues. Riders, you know, with uh, uh, driver shortages and labor shortages, and then of course the the capacity issues that we know about. So just managing that every day, we have to be very flexible and, and, and ready to handle that as a logistics provider. So some some great examples in action there. Um, before we go into some of the other details, Max, I'm just interested from Bentler's point of view. How does it differ or compare in terms of that, that early phase planning. As I mentioned early on, I mean, it's a tier one, you, you have some different, obviously some different constraints, whether it's, if it's directed supply or own, own sourcing. So can you just give us some insight into the process from, for Bentley? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. So yeah, the Bentley is a global tier one supplier. So we um, uh, produce uh, structure, chassis parts and model assembly. So uh, in most of the cases, um, if we have a new project in the chassis or structures area, so this is a free source. So it means that uh, it's up to us um, to define where we source the raw material, the components, etc. Uh, in the model assembly, the situation is a little bit trickier as usual. So here, uh, normally the OEM provides the bill of material. And in the models assembly, normally the bill of material is quite quite big. So it's 500 part numbers approximately. So and. Uh, they provide the bill of material and uh, and they tell us where to buy the part. So um, yeah, there is one of our biggest plant in North America, basically dedicated to only one customer, uh, who is which is doing the models assembly. Um, all the parts directed by, and just like can give you an example. So 25% approximately we are sourcing from out uh, overseas. Mm -hmm. 
50% from Mexico and then uh, remaining 25% uh, um, locally. Yeah. But the local sources also, uh, <laughs> I mean, in the United States, the distance is quite big. It's, yeah. uh, it's yeah. uh, not the European uh, side. So, um, yeah, so this is, let's say, given, and then it's up to us to make a design of the supply chain. So uh, we have experts. Uh, one of them is here in this uh, room, by the way. Um, <laughs> who are working on the design, So, and we start from the beginning. So this is the design of the packaging, we uh, design of the inbound logistic, uh, design of the shop floor logistic, line feeding, warehousing, uh, internal transportation. So we are responsible to um, nominate the providers, uh, working with the providers, etc. So basically this is a, a lot of things to do. Um, and then we offer uh, the logistic cost to the customer. So if the customer agrees, fine, then we need to maintain the level of cost and somehow try to improve. Um, yeah, if the cost go up, then we need to uh, yeah, you know, somehow try to offset. Mm -hmm. Or in, in the current situation when you cannot offset, for example, 250% uh, ocean freight increase, so then you need to somehow find another solution. Um, in the free source, the situation is more or less the same. As I said, it's just only up to us to define where we buy the material. In most of the cases, we as a global company, we also have a global programs. So if we work with uh, Toyota, for example, somewhere in um, uh, China, we probably do the same products in North America or in Europe. So uh, the supplier base in most of the cases is th the same. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and um, that's, uh, and then the, the preparation and supply chain design is more or less the same. So yeah. it's, up, it's up to us. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, it, I think it's just it's good to establish the, that sort of framework uh, and interesting insights from both of you. Uh, Richard, can you talk to us about what what sort of best practice in in, in logistics design and engineering looks like from Carter's point of view? Yeah, yeah and I, I guess it's probably different between OEMs and also tier sure. ones. Um, on the OEM side, uh, uh, Toyota uh, designs all the routes, so we're kind of a recipient of that data. So all that data analysis and designing the routes and consolidation doesn't happen as much on Toyota side. Um, the challenge is though with Toyota, on Toyota side, which it's, it's a good challenge is we've gotta be flexible because we do a lot of test parts for them. So when they've launched the Wano Wano um, facility and also the Huntsville facility, we were collecting parts through all of our cross docks and those parts would change from week to week, so we would have to redesign the supply chain to get all those parts collected and then delivered timely to uh, Steve's uh, organization. Um, and it was a little bit more challenging in the Mexico marketplace because in the U.S. we have all of our trucks, in Mexico we have partners. So a little bit different dynamic down in Mexico. The other challenge in Mexico is in the last two years just due to a lot of shortages of uh, materials, trailers have been very uh, hard to come by. Um, the organization and the supply chain we took over, uh, partially along with Ryder going down to Guanajuato, um, had a lot of trailers. So with that, we had to secure a sizable number of trailers to handle that product from, um, from the from their suppliers in the U.S. all the way down to their plant. Um, so that created some challenges and additional challenges in Huntsville during the period where product was being stored at certain points in time on trailers. So I think it's probably capacity planning um, of both tractors and trailers, probably the biggest challenge on the OEM side. Mm. And, uh, and as you mentioned, but it's, it's, it's different in the tier for the tier ones. So yeah. there, do you tend to get more into the logistics? Yeah, well, it, it really starts with the data analysis mm -hmm. side. Um, we do a lot of work, probably about a you know two, three week period, maybe a month period, where we really try to um, look at the data, ask questions, get response on packaging, other type of issues, labeling. After that, we go into a um, design stage, um, that design stage is really uh, delivering the product of what we see as the ideal supply chain mm -hmm. based upon the factors that we're seeing in the uh, design itself and also the cost. 
after that it gets into implementation. Implementation can take from three months to a year <coughs> depending upon the complexities of it. Some of the customers we're dealing with, we ramp up. So it's, it's not just we don't turn the light on at one time, but we gradually get into it so that the customer can kind of, on a smaller scale, get used to our um, working with our CI team and our analyst as far as the routes. And uh, after implementation, it's post-implementation like everything else as you look at what you got and say, it's not working or it is working fine. And sometimes we find some surprises on packaging. Sometimes we find some surprises on labeling that makes a cross dot doc network very difficult to function if the labeling isn't correct. So those are things that the OEMs don't have, but what we do see within the tier one network. Mm. Ken, you, you said up front that you're seeing, you know, customers using the tactical aspects of, uh, of your software in there strategic planning as well. So what, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the, the best way a tool like yours can be used to, to, um, you know, to really make the best logistic design and network decisions early on? <coughs> Perfect data. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's too easy. Um, no, I mean, you, you know, as a planner, you like to have perfect data and, and <coughs> more time, you know, to, to go into it. But, um, you know, really a hard part, I, I think maybe somebody mentioned it yesterday too, but it's the people side, mm. you know, what, how can you make the, the technology piece work better? You still have to have some really good planners, you know, you have to have the kind of people that can work throughout the organization. They don't, you know, they aren't restricted to just wearing a logistics hat. They have to understand packaging engineering and be able to work with production control and materials and understand what their real needs are, mm. you know, and, and supplier purchasing. So they have has to be somebody that can work throughout the organization through the whole supply chain and understands it, and then also has that right skill set to be able to run the tool and do the analysis and that, you know, kind of thing. So, mm. I mean, we're we're trying to do things that make it easier to use our technology um, you know if uh, if you can get um, an operations guy you know traditionally an operations guy and and make the technology easy enough for him to use right um, now you have now you have somebody that has a really good understanding of the network and what it should look like on the end and and knows how to use the technology it's great you don't have to have the uh, person that you used to lock in a closet in the corner <laughs> and run, you know, 18 different databases to, to come, you know, if, if we can help you help, help the user, help the client make the technology a little bit easier to use, uh, you know, so more, more people in your organization can, can use it. You can engage the, the folks that have the right operational experience, you know, to use it, then that's, that's the ideal situation. And are you seeing sort of more use to simulate different models and, and more efforts to, to e you know, th therefore, you know, have the data more seamlessly to, to do these sorts of simulations? And yeah, and that's, you know, you, you do one scenario and then you want, you know, 20 more <laughs> questions come after that. So, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, we see people using the technology to do all these different what-if scenarios. Uh, you answer the first two questions and then, you know, the, the supply chain team, you know, comes back with 20 more to follow <laughs> up, so. And they want the answer quick, right? Yeah. <laughs> and has that become more of an approach for you, Steve, and your teams and that sort of scenario planning compared to previously and, and using tools? I mean, not just Agilence, but perhaps Agilence and others to, to do that simulation? Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's the, the data is a very difficult part to, to get it to, to use those different types of tools. Uh, we, we, did, we did use one of their tools for a, a, a network um, evaluation on our service part side. Went, went really well. Sorry about the data, though. I, was on it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're talking. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's good. It's, you know, I think uh, in the future, you know, Toyota's got a, a lot of homegrown 
design tools and systems, but we, you know, we have to create the ability to go outside that when we need to, and that's where we're kind of, you know, focused is looking at where the opportunities are to use more advanced tools that we have in house to, to, to really improve what we're doing. And Maxim, is, is that also becoming more important? So, tool uh, using different tools to simulate and do scenario planning, um, especially with some of the complexities that we see in the network right now. Um. You, you, um, what are you asking about the si tools for? Si for yeah, are you, are you also using or, or, or using more homegrown tools or newer tools to, to do this sort of scenario planning? Or again, is the yeah. data t bit too no, complex? Yeah, we, we basically as a company globally, we're working with SAP and everything what SAP provides we can, we're trying to use as much as we can. Uh, but um, we're also exploring a new, uh, new thing. So for example, we are now in the final phase of uh, TMS implementation, for example, to okay. see how can we basically manage the freight better um, and yeah, in general we're always open for the for the new things yeah yeah, yeah. so we, we, we know there are examples I mean we've, we've spoken about I think both with Carter and and logistic uh, and Toyota previously about examples where networks can be combined and optimized I think there's you know with several different OEMs for example Steve when you're looking at those sort of opportunities um, is that something you know your team's can help find these synergies, or do you really then also then depend more on your partners to, if you like, open up the view to perhaps where a cross dock can be shared or other facilities can be shared? Yeah, I think there's you know there's really no doubt that we want our LPs to be true partners in everything that we do, and we and we are looking, I think, much more than a few years ago for the LPs to be innovative and show us what they have and, and what the opportunities are with technology with uh, if there's a route, uh, oper route optimization opportunity with another OE or supplier, that type of thing. You know, of course, we, we look at those things, but the LP really has a better sense for some of that than we do, right? We're, we're really focused on maintaining our operations and that type of thing. So, yeah, we, we've really asked our LPs, you know, please come to the table quickly with any thoughts or ideas or innovation that you have. And I think uh, they've done a great job, honestly. It's been really good the last couple of years on what we've seen. Yeah. Can you note that as a, sorry, Richard, as a, as a, as a trend, I mean, Steve has said there, they're more open to it, Toyota's more open to it. Is, it, is that ac across other customers as well? Well, yeah, For our shared network is already kind of, is shared and mm -hmm. we're constantly looking at it. We're utilizing the Agilent software to do the precursor. It used to be that we started with our brains and then <laughs> vouched it from there, but now we're doing it through the software and then doing the human intervention on top of it from a DOT compliance standpoint, from a, you know, knowing our customers and their packaging. So that's how we're using Agilence. We're also using Agilence during, um, for our OEM consolidations. Um, now, that's, it's been challenging. We, we kicked off quite a few consolidations, um, but we've had we're constantly looking at recruiting drivers and adding tractors uh -huh. to our organization. And the major um, focus is in Andersonville, which is right outside of Knoxville, where we do a lot of consolidations. There's a lot of additional opportunities that we need to come to Toyota because we're starting, we're starting to generate a lot more drivers, mm -hmm. po which is positive, and a lot more tractors, which will then help support this consolidation. Um, so that's how we're helping the Toyota organization. And, you know, with their launch in um, Huntsville, it's got, it takes a time to stabilize the network. You don't want to mess with a network that is still growing. So, I mean, there's a lot more opportunities to come on the consolidations between OEMs in, out of the Huntsville area, but it's after that network is stabilized. Mm. Do you agree? I mean, it's way too <laughs> premature. Yes. <I> yes. <laughs> okay. No question. I just wanted to make sure. See. <laughs> Don't ask him for his data yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can hear hear the use of use of the software too, to run these sorts of, of things. But again, it, it, I'm assuming that does depend on who is willing and able to to share the information to to, to then use the tool to make it clear. Yeah. It's the information you know 
that obviously starts at the OEM and and they have to be able to share you know downstream to um, the uh, service providers um, and, and make it available to everyone yeah Steve you started when you talked about the process and obviously uh, logistics has a strong seat at the table so we're putting directly to the engineering of for the for the program um, so you're you know actively trying to influence those those points localization supplier locations uh, etc how do you see the current scenario um, changing or strengthening that influence and and I guess how do you account for the kind of so clearly with as Maxim said if ocean rates are 150 percent what was the norm how do you try to factor that in over a longer period of time with the current with some shifting I mean do we base it on this is the new normal or do we try to <laughs> account for some some change ahead yeah that's a good question I think uh, we're probably all trying to understand that a little bit still but uh, you know when you're when you're dealing with a new model or a new plant you have a baseline you know and it's based on whenever that that uh, activity started and you know and if it started three years ago obviously the numbers are much different today so you know we, we, we do try to keep track of that and of yeah. course keep that communication that you know this was three years ago and this is what it looks like it's going to be you know this year so it has to be very transparent and it has to be everyone has to understand you know if, if there's a certain target what the impact of all the changes uh, have, have been a good or bad right but uh, it, it's it, it, it's just about you know sometimes you know getting stuck on the original baseline is hard to, to change but you know I think all areas of the organization are trying to say hey things have changed significantly so let's make sure it's fully transparent of what the what it's going to look like and then do we keep that in the plan long term it's a little bit you know, I've got a question about that one a little bit right now because, you know, some of these rate things are, can change yeah. very quickly, right? The economy changes, something goes the other direction, and you don't necessarily want to make a localization decision based on those types of things that can fluctuate a lot over a, over a short period of time. So uh, you have to be really careful with that, that kind of decision making. Absolutely. Maxim, similar point of view. I mean, you, as you, you mentioned, um, there are parts of your supply chain which are perhaps fairly fixed with the tooling and the global program so but nonetheless the logistics influence is certainly important um, so how, do, how are you trying to account for this exceptional disruption in terms of looking further ahead to, to how you plan your networks and, and look at those figures well um, so first of all I think <coughs> with everything was going on in the market so we are kind of also as I said in the beginning we are learning and we are exploring new tools and new technologies etc etc and I think one uh, one thing what I really like that we kind of even if we are not like a freight company we're a production company we're focusing on the producing parts and deliver to the customers but I think uh, during the last two three years we become really like a freight expert yeah. So <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, we understand the market, so we, uh, we know uh, the trends, so we know um, maybe even, uh, we, we don't have, I hate this word, but anyway, I, we don't have the crystal ball, but, but at least we can at least uh, mm. make some forecast. Using the analytical tool, so um, for ocean freight, for road freight, and basically it helps us a lot to talk with our um, also mm, service providers. So uh, we are taking the situation as it is, so we are also trying to take our decisions um, based on the data. We, uh, Using the data, we are able to explain the decisions to the management because sometimes it's not, um, yeah, maybe not popular, maybe sometimes it's, uh, on the first glance strange, uh, it looks strange, mm. but um, yeah, that yeah. kind of things. It, you echo very much some of your, your colleagues from, um, we had American Axel um, on the panel yesterday, they talked about being a freight forwarder in the background, almost having to become uh, you know, experts inside their organizations. Um, and that also therefore depends on working with partners to get that information as well. Give the opportunity for the audience, anyone, anyone want to pose any questions, raise any other thoughts on this side? We have a question right, right here in the third row on the, my left, if we can have a mic up here in the front please. It's on its way to you, and when you get the mic, just just say say your name and where where you're representing today. Thank you, Shakira. 
Hello, um, Art Klein, Joyce and Safety Systems. Um, I'm just wondering, have you guys developed a methodology to maybe, you know, forecast and calculate like total cost of ownership and uh, is that is that part of the decision process for you? Maybe Steve, you can start with that one. <laughs> Are you talking about product total cost of ownership? Uh, yes, but also considering the, the freight cost involved with it, right? So, I mean, not just the actual material costs, the, the production costs, right? But, you know, what the overall freight cost is from A to Z in terms of, you know, from supplier to plant and then from plant to customer. Yeah, when we're, yeah, when we're doing a new model cost planning, yeah, all that's in considered, yes, including finished fi finish vehicle cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any... Any other questions? I didn't know if I saw it on a hand up. Okay. Um, one of my favorite quotes, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. Um, <laughs> I think the great logistics guru Mike Tyson said that. Um, <laughs> and I think you all feel like we've probably been taking a few punches in the face the last couple of years. The thing that has come out of, 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 of many of our discussions is that flexibility, you also referenced it. And I'm just interested to understand now how much you're looking to design more with this flexibility in mind, because we're living with it. You know, the baselines aren't, aren't quite the same. Are there key processes or, or steps you can take, or is it tools or partnerships, um, to think about flexibility as well right from the beginning? Uh, I'll start with you again, Steve, and I'm interested if anyone has other thoughts on it. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think, you know, when we're developing the initial logistics design, um, we, we don't really talk about if the abnormal happens, such as a port issue, something like that. But, you know, we, we have increased our, our tools to use for that type of issue. So all the things that we've been through over the last several years, you know, a lot of tools have been developed to handle that. But we don't put that into the original design because really, or the cost model either, because it, it can... If that happens, we want to clearly be, be very transparent. This is an abnormal situation, and this is how we're going to try to fix and 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 handle that situation to push that cost down as quickly as possible. You know, that that type of thing is what we, we want to make it a problem that we have to focus on immediately to go after it, and not make it look like it's okay because the costs are okay based on the original plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that type of thing. Does that makes sense. It does. It okay. Does. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, a good example is. Um, you know, with this, with with the port uh, blank sailings that we've all faced in the winter and spring, it was very, you know, very difficult on the West Coast. So, you know, we, we, we thought about all the tools, you know, alternate ports, all those types of things, and we, we pulled out all the tools we had and uh, had a lot of great partners on that. But ultimately, we ended up using uh, tr charter vessels into the East Coast. We also used um, uh, our, ves our vehicle vessels uh, for parts because... Um, there's some opportunity there. We don't want there to be opportunity there. We want those to be full with vehicles, but because there's some opportunity, we took advantage of that and, and used those for parts as well mm. to help offset that mm. blank selling situation. So, yeah, yeah. But Maxim, um, I think we, we discussed a, uh, a little bit about the consolidation. So for us, it is also kind of interesting topic, and I, d I discussed with um, some of some of the guys here, um, the opportunities to also to consolidate and to share basically the, the space in the truck, for example, with other companies. It's also kind of flexibility. So mm -hmm. normally we are buying um, um, uh, trucks and organizing the trucks by ourselves. This is works pr pretty good with the full truck loads for the LTL, for the meal trans. So sometimes you have to, um, to share or you don't have enough volume. So, I mean, if... Uh, uh, the providers are coming with the proactive uh, proposals so are able to consolidate and basically uh, make us pay only what we use is great. Um, if we're talking about other, let's say, flexibility uh, solutions, what we implemented during this uh, difficult time, so um, I think what I can um, remember now, for example, we know historically that the peak season uh, is always hard the hard time here. So. Uh, Last year was was very very difficult. So end of the year, beginning of the year, and peak season, China New Year, uh, the transit time this year, as I said, was double ocean. So um, we are trying proactively to take some measures, and basically already now for the specific lanes, adjust the transit time in SAP. So this is the tool we are using for the material planning, 
and somehow anticipate the problems and uh, trying to avoid the premium freight cost, for example. Um, another thing what we did also, um, which worked pretty good, so in the beginning of the year during this crisis, uh, also working with um, uh, some of the guys here, uh, so we implement like an air freight program, so uh, which we which was uh, not easy to sell because this is something what we try to avoid every time. So the air freight is a premium freight, which is one of the KPI, and we would like to keep it on the zero level. But in the con in the market condition we currently have, it's not possible. And basically, it uh, we were able to explain to like CEO to the CEO that it mm -hmm. makes sense to buy every week five tons during one month, um, and we in the end save a lot. So we saved a lot. So that kind of creative solutions um, we're trying to implement and to increase the flexibility. That's also great examples from both. Richard, any other points you'd make on designing for flexibility? Yeah, you know, I think um, the pandemic, it, it verified one thing for us. Um, you know, it turned my stomach every day seeing all the red iron. Um, sitting on the side of the road and at our cross dock. I mean, all it was is I saw red numbers when I looked at, <laughs> when I looked at all the red trucks every day. Um, but what it did is it reinforced that we have control of our own flexibility. We have control of our own drivers. We've got control of our assets. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to rely on four or five other partners that might have gone out and found other freight during the shutdown. It was something that we could turn the spigot on right away once the tier ones and the OEMs started producing again. So you know, the kick in the gut was definitely, you know, the two months, three months that our trucks were shut down. But the positive side of it is I think we it showed that the flexibility we have is very critical mm -hmm. to um, why a lot of customers are with us. Ken, any other, other thoughts there? I mean, is this, is this sort of dynamic flexibility ultimately really dependent on having that right data set to understand and, you know, and, and see where, where things can really work? Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, having, having great data, in the, you know, in the first place, having access to it, you know, um, giving you the ability to quickly then put it into a, a tool and see where there's new opportunities or alternate opportunities when the first plan goes wrong or the first plan fails yeah that's yeah that's a pretty pretty obvious one mm. um, I think uh, I've seen I've seen some of our customers you know look to consolidation maybe a little bit more um, things like the the shared network you know that Carter's talking about or or whether it's whether it's that for trucking or whether it's for ocean um, those shared networks, um, well, 10 years ago, we were like, well, it, se it seems like a good way to save money, but now I, I think it's becoming more obvious that those shared networks like that allow you to absorb those ups and downs, um, the dramatic ups and downs, maybe a little bit more cost effectively than those dedicated networks yeah. always in the past. And obviously it's not the same answer for, for everybody, you know, if you've got enough volume to support your own network, great. But there's definitely situations where, you know, um, sharing makes sense specifically to help absorb some of those ups and downs. Mm. Okay, so definitely, definitely a common thread there on, on sharing. Uh, we're coming towards the end here, and we have another, another panel. Uh, but maybe, uh, maybe a last question to you, Steve. Just, it's probably too early to go into any detail about this, but, but clearly when we talk about designing uh, the network for future, there's also a tremendous amount of change to come um, in terms of Toyota's public announcements on you know, sort of EV, battery factories, et cetera, which are to come. Um, so I guess just do you, do you anticipate that that will adapt or change some of the processes that you currently do to, to design and engineer networks early on? I mean, clearly there will be some new considerations and partners perhaps involved in that. Um, again, I realize it's probably too soon to talk about detail, but I'm just wondering if you're thinking about that now and, and thinking about how the processes may, may adapt. Yeah, on the inbound side, I don't see a whole lot of change. We already have started some of the activity around the, the battery plant. Um, and 
of course, there's some differences in the commodities and things like that, which we have to ensure good packaging and di or a different style of packaging or different type of trailer or something like that. Who knows what's going to ha have to happen there. So, but the um, probably the biggest thing that uh, that we're trying to get our head around is you know the the service side of it. So the, that whole we already have batteries, obviously, with our hybrid uh, vehicles, but as the volume increases, we want to make sure that that whole system is, is uh, kind of mainstream. And of course, you've got Reman and, and all those types of opportunities with batteries. So there's a lot of, of um, study going on on that side of it, for sure. OK, yeah, absolutely interesting. So just I want to close just from each for some parting thoughts on uh, some concrete goals and actions that we should look at to improve this process of collaborating from the start and design from the start. Um, uh, we'll just go, go short answer. So start with you on that, Ken. There's still room inside the manufacturer for collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about between inbound team, service parts team, you know, outbound. I'm still seeing like room within the, within the manufacturer to, to improve that collaboration. And um, share data and, mm -hmm. and all that. So I, I mean, I think that's a, a great place to put some focus on in the next year. Great, okay. Richard? Yeah, I think um, it's really, with the Huntsville startup, we've had a lot of our continuous improvement team um, there. I've seen it also with our tier ones. Our, pe our people are more present mm -hmm. than what they were previously, and it's good. Um, so when we la launch new customers, our, our people are on site looking at the packaging in the war room with the customer to make sure that we're correcting issues right away. So I, it's been a development over the last, I would say, two or three years, and I just want to make sure that it continues, that we're out in front of our customers and helping them whatever way we can during any type of uh, conversion. Excellent. Maxim, final thoughts? Yeah, um, for me, basically the priorities for the for the next year is somehow to make the logistics smart. And for me, smart is is a simple thing. Mm -hmm. First, um, I need to have a good location. Is it and it's uh, supply location or or rental location? Mm. So in the past, basically, we were trying to move all the uh, a lot of um, projects to Mexico and uh, shipping from Mexico to the US. I don't know. Now we need to maybe review the business case. Does it make sense or not? So it's kind of interesting topic. I need to. We need to focus on the truck utilization. So it's also a basic thing. But if we go into details and we check truck by truck, I, I'm pretty sure that everybody knows that there is a lot of inefficiencies there. To make the truck 100% or 95% utilized, we need a good packaging. So um, good. Um, um, damage return ratio. So we, and we can use here different things. Is it a one-way packaging? It can be rented packaging. It can be, uh, f it should be foldable packaging, but definitely not direct, which is, let's say, one-to-one -one you are delivering back. So that kind of things. Again, basic things, but uh, I'm pretty sure that even us, we had in the past that kind of uh, mm. issues. We should avoid extra cost, double handling, maybe duties. Um, relabeling, storage, everything like that. And of course, we need to um, yeah, think outside the box and try to create, uh, um, somehow create some, uh, uh, generate creative solutions um, for the for the cost mitigation. But in general, if let's say collaborating, if I'm uh, looking a little bit wider, so we uh, together we need to work on the risk mitigation. And here I expect a really strong support from the providers cost reduction. So we were, uh, we were having two years <laughs> surcharge after surcharge, which we have to increase. <laughs> so <laughs> now it looks like so in, in some lanes the costs go down and we would like to basically uh, to also to have a cooperation here and means that we need to reduce the cost. Um, we need to stay accountable. I think this is uh, maybe the topic for a different discussion, but, but I was always a little bit um, wonder because if we if I look at the let's say ocean freight sometimes I think that is the only tier one is accountable for the due dates if uh, the vessel is late provider is saying this is carrier 
here uh, is not accountable for anything. So uh, something is wrong here. So I would like to have this cooperation so that everyone is accountable and everyone uh, cooperating. We can do the supply chain more stable. I think. So great, great points to leave us with, Steve. Last word is yours. Yeah, yeah I'll be quick. The, you know, for us, it's you can just kind of put it into one big item, which is customer experience. So the customer experience for inbound for manufacturing is manufacturing. So how can we continue to improve the data that they receive, the visibility they receive? So if if they they have different things going on, they can manage through that very easily. If they want to make product uh, production changes, they, they can handle that through the data. You know, on the service side, same thing. How do we continue to improve the customer experience from supplier all the way through the network to the final customer? You know, you've got the e-commerce, you've got uh, dealers, et cetera. So how do we continue to use and, and visualize better, become more agile with that data? Fantastic. So uh, th thank you so much. This was uh, great points from the panel. I think we picked up a lot of common themes on areas for collaboration, on, on data, uh, but also some very great insights for Toyota and Bentler and across our panel here. So thank you, everyone, for, for your time here.